Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we're delighted to see so many of you here today. Um, it's also being recorded, so for anyone who's watching this later, hello to you too. Uh, I'm Dr. Paul Longran Fady. I'm a senior parliamentary researcher in the office of Baroness Bennett. Um, I'm just going to introduce uh, our host, Baroness Bennett, and our chair, Dr. Lisa Tilly, and at which point I'll hand over and, and uh, stop boring you. Um, so Baroness Bennett uh, almost needs no introduction, but then you sort of wonder why I'm here doing this. Um, she's a longtime environmental campaigner uh, who's worked extensively on climate and environmental uh, issues. Um, I've just taken a gander at what you've done in the last two months. Um, just, just to give an idea of the scale, it's been years and years, obviously, uh, Baroness Bennett was the uh, ex-leader of the Green Party for England and Wales uh, for many years and was in Noble in 2019, um, since when she's obviously been, been here as one of two Green Party peers. In the last two months alone, and I mean the last two sitting months of the House of Lords, not including the Christmas break, um, you... Uh, um, spoke on, you criticized uh, His Majesty's government on the net zero commitments, which is obviously very salient for today, um, in light of the uh, Economic Affairs Committee report in October. You also contributed to um, Baroness Heyman's private notice question on climate change, um, specifically on uh, insulation. And in November, uh, spoke in the oral question uh, by Lord Harry's of Pentagoth uh, on private jets and uh, methane emissions. So that, that is literally the last two months on climate alone. So you can imagine the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes on environment as well. Um, so Baroness Bennett has very kindly agreed to host today, um, and we're very grateful to her for that. Um, our chair is Dr. Lisa Tilly from the from SUBAS, the School of Oriental African Studies. Um, she uh, teaches post uh, sorry uh, political ecology at SUBAS. Uh, her work explores materialist approaches to race in relation to the climate crisis, uh, extraction, colonialism, and capitalism. So um, I'll hand over to Lisa now to uh, introduce the rest of the panel, and thank you both so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you to everyone for coming. It's really wonderful to see um, so many fresh faces here. Um, um, this event is is on uh, what's well, called Climate Commitment, Holding the Government Accountable on Net Zero. Um, and um, I really want to extend um, thanks to, to the SOAS um, ICOP team and Sanjana Dean in particular for, for organizing, doing so much of the hard organizing labor that's gone into this um, event. Um, so obviously the, the focus today is really on the question of how we can hold the government um, accountable on its net zero commitments um, and how we can think of ways to, to collectively wor work towards this um, accountability. So as I'm sure you're all aware, the government has a commitment to reaching net zero by, by 2050 through um, decarbonizing, as they would put it, all sectors of, of the economy. So this is something that we can really interrogate and, and pick apart today. Um, another question um, that's really central to this event is the uh, really on the broader impact of the UK's progress towards net zero and how this impacts other countries as, as well. Um, so we are really honored today to have some some incredible speakers. Um, so we have with us Manchenje um, Mazoka, um, um, hopefully Stuti Mishra, who should be joining us um, uh, virtually, and uh, Ruchi Parekh as well, who will also uh, who will no doubt offer offer great insight into into this topic. So just to give you a bit of um, an overview of, um, um, of, of our speakers. Um, so Manchenje Mazoka, first of all, was um, recently appointed um, High Commissioner of the Republic of Zambia to, to the UK just last year. Um, um, she has over 30 years of experience um, in the communication sector. Um, prior to her diplomatic appointment, um, Ms. Mazoka managed regional communications and stakeholder relations for the South African Broadcasting Corporation. Um, after having launched and led the Corporation's Funding and Partnerships Department, she's also been affiliated with the South African Audiovisual Forum, the African Tourism Board, and, um, and Develop Z Zambia Forum. Um, so I think we can uh, pass over actually to, to Machenje um, to, to, start us, to start us off if you want to make some, some initial 
uh, remarks, that would be wonderful. And the audience can be thinking of, of questions for all of the speakers, which we'll, we'll turn to you at the end. And just before we do that, I feel like I should warn everybody, I may have to dash out, there will be a vote, which means some bells will ring very, very loudly. They will almost certainly not be a fire alarm, so don't panic. Um, uh, so something to be aware of. And I feel like we, I should also do the, there are loons down on the left if you need them doing doing the, uh, the host, you know, safety message thing. And my unofficial safety message is this place is a tinderbox. It's fire alarm does go off and run like hell. That's, <laughs> that's the unofficial advice. But, you know, uh, seriously, you know, make your way safely to the exits. Blah, blah, blah. But um, but yes, yeah, so don't worry. Don't be alarmed when the bells go off for a vote and you'll see me dash out the door. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here. Baroness, it's a pleasure to meet you. And thank you for hosting us. And of course, the... Um, invitation to have such a wonderful conversation about a very, very important issue to all of us. Um, yes, I'm new to my post here in the UK, about probably about five and a half months old, so quite new. Um, and prior to that, I've been um, uh, entrenched in public service media for the last 30 years. Um, maybe just some opening remarks. Um, I think that uh, the UK's plan is ambitious. It is, um, I think, something that is needed. Uh, uh, um, should all the boxes be taken? <laughs> um, and I think that is kind of par for the course when we look at an ambitious goal and, and targets. But better to aim high and uh, shoot and land amongst the stars, you know, if you will, uh, than... Um, to not uh, be as aggressive as we need to be as a global community. But in terms of um, maybe taking the perspective of the quote unquote global South and uh, your least developed nations um, as compared to our other country or other countries like the United States, United Kingdom, et cetera, I think where we can really garner support and, uh, and, and get help from particularly the United Kingdom or issues around global leadership uh, and influence. Financing is a major, major issue, particularly if we look at how are we going to pay for all these wonderful goals and dreams that we need to try and address. So financing is a major issue. And I think that's where your developed nations can come together and collectively think a little bit more broadly about the rest of the world. Not saying that it doesn't happen, but I think we can always do better in that regard. Um, financial support and investment, as I mentioned, there are a lot of, um, there's a huge price tag uh, to this transition that we're trying to undergo, and who will pay for it? Your smaller nation states, um, your least developed uh, nations cannot cover that, those costs. Um, and, and also, look at the argument that's out there, you know, in terms of who caused a lot of the uh, mm -hmm. the challenges that we're currently dealing with, it is certainly is not the the least developed nations. Just because, from a manufacturing perspective, from from a development perspective, um, the the two don't match. So therefore, if you made the mess, you got to clean it up. <laughs> um, but. Being that we're all under the same sky, if you will, then I think it does need to take a collective approach. So we do need strong partnerships in that regard. Um, and I always have had this big question, particularly lately, that, and I know at COP28, it wasn't really resolved, but the issue of carbon credits. Where are we with carbon credits? How are we going to deal with that? How can we make it equitable? You know, um, How can we make that equitable? But those questions around financing are key. Um, another one is technology transfer. Um, I think that would be a great component that could certainly aid uh, countries that may not necessarily have the wherewithal in that regard in terms of how to use technology to um, really reduce emissions, you know, and um, and 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 so forth. Capacity building again. That kind of speaks to the earlier point about um, taking a global leadership perspective, but capacity building with people across the world on the ground in smaller nations, you know, in um, island states that are, as we know, are gonna be hugely impacted, probably more so even than least developed states, but you, small island nations are really, really at risk. Um, even in Zambia, I mean, we're, we're experiencing some major challenges in terms of drought, 
in terms of flash floods, something that we have never really encountered before. As a result, now we have a huge cholera outbreak that we're trying to contain. But all of that came, you know, um, uh, soon after these flash floods and their food security issues that are also compounding um, uh, some of the challenges that we're undergoing. So um, it's a ripple effect. Uh, so capacity building will also assist, you know, in terms of that. But I don't think I can really stress uh, the whole issue of debt and financial stability, um, you know, uh, more than anything else. Um, so there, there are challenges that, that are faced by the quote unquote global south. So when it comes to greening our economies, again, it's it's expensive, it's costly. I, all, I often say when I have this conversation, we have um, rural people, we have a very rural um, um, uh, uh, communities. And Oftentimes they will cut down trees to make what's called malasha, which is the uh, local name for charcoal. So you go cut trees, make malasha, burn it, and use it so that they can cook, warm their homes, feed families. Very difficult conversation to have to say, please don't cut down the trees and burn for malasha because they can say, well, then how will I eat? You know, how will I feed my family? How will I keep my family warm? So those are the challenges that we're dealing with, you know, particularly when we don't have large budgets to expend, you know, on our people um, in the way that we may want to. Um, so how do we reconcile with that? Uh, and I think that's where countries and, uh, you know, such as the UK can lend support where we can join hands. And and again, it's not just in Zambia, but even if you look at, you know, the, the whole continent, you know, we often follow, um, uh, suffer from similar challenges. Uh, and particularly the nations that might be in the Southern Ash uh, Southern Africa region where we have very similar uh, con conditions on the ground. So I think that's yeah. my first, uh, first stab at it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, there's some really interesting and important themes emerging already, especially in terms of um, the different differential impacts of different societies, um, not just in in, con in the contemporary moment, but also historically, um, which speaks very much to um, the, you know, this major question of where the responsibility lies, who owes who um, in, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of responsibility, for climate change and other forms of, of environmental harm and what the what the answers are going forwards um, around forms of um, forms of finance and it also really takes us to to the question of, of reparations yeah. really um, which is something that hopefully we can talk about a bit more in, in the questions um, um, all of these different um, mechanisms of, of finance, of new forms of debt mechanisms, which are coming through with, with climate change, um, and other forms of aid, and of course, climate reparations and loss and damage funding. All of this is sort of within the um, broader bracket of, of finance, but um, all of these things are not the same, and they'll they'll each have very different different impacts on communities of, of the global south. So lots to be thinking about there, and and for the audience to think about in terms of questions as well. Um, do we have Stuti on online, or did the um, we can we can go to should we go to to Ruchi and yeah, oh, Stuti's online, is she? Um, so I'll just introduce um, our next speaker, who's uh, Stuti Mishra, who's Asia Climate Correspondent at The Independent. A lot of you will probably know um, her wonderful journalism. She generally covers the climate crisis and extreme weather events. Um, and in this role, she has reported from, um, from the, the UN climate summits. She's extensively covered various disasters um, especially in the global south, including floods in Pakistan and heat waves in India. Stuti was awarded the Climate Justice Fellowship by Climate Tracker in 2021, and she became a member of the Oxford Climate Journalism uh, Network the, the same year. So um, if the tech is on our side, I'll pass over to Stuti. Um, yeah, very important again to think think about those um uh you know injustices between the global south and, and the global north. 
and the the problem that the global north is seen as you know the rule rule setters but not the rule followers um and really the need at this point um to to set an example um especially considering the structural and embedded inequities that we have we have in in the world system um so now i will pass over to to ruchi parekh just to to give you a quick um introduction ruchi is a public law barrister specializing in environment and planning law she has particular experience in matters relating to the climate ranging from renewable and low carbon energy infrastructure to legal challenges based on climate grounds in 2023, she was named in the ENDS report power list of the most influential environmental professionals in the UK, one of only three barristers to be included. And she has really fantastic expertise in this area. So we're very lucky to, to have her here. So take it away, Ruchi. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. I'm super excited to be here and just hearing from the other speakers so far has been, makes me feel like I want to talk about a lot of other things that I wasn't intending to speak about. Um, but I think um, given that I'm a barrister, I work in the UK and I work in the UK courts, well, England and Wales, um, Welsh courts, um, I think probably best for me in the first instance to just give you an overview of how I think that the law and courts can work in this space um, and then engage in future discussions with the other points that were made. Um, just to say at the outset, as a barrister, I work on all sides. So I also work for the government, I work for NGOs, I work for private companies. Um, and so in that respect, I will be a bit more measured in uh, what I say publicly in a recorded forum. But um, in the last <laughs> year, um, I have been involved in a number of cases, as Lisa mentioned, um, brought by either local resident groups or NGOs challenging government policy around um, reaching net zero. So in particular, the new oil and gas licensing round that was announced in 2022 that will lead to uh, the award of 100 new oil and gas licenses, offshore oil and gas licenses. Um, and also um, in terms of onshore oil projects, um, one of which the legal challenge was heard in the Supreme Court last year, we're in the summer and we're still waiting for judgment. And then um, on the other side, I also work um, in renewable energy projects, so things like solar farm, offshore wind farms. Obviously, I don't do anything around onshore wind because uh, the policy in this country means that there's a de facto ban on onshore wind, which is um, mind boggling. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, okay, I might get sidetracked though if I just focus on that. So I'm going to pause there. So, um, in just in terms of themes, I was trying to think about um, you know, what it means to be um, using law as a way of holding government to account. And in many ways, this country makes it very easy to do so because we have a beautiful piece of legislation. You know, when we talk about net zero, it comes from statute, it comes from the Climate Change Act, and it legislated it um, that the government needs to reach, reach net zero. So it's a positive obligation on the sec Secretary of State. And it was one of the first countries, certainly the first Western country to implement something like this. So, um, you know, I think you were saying it's ambitious, it's it's huge. And for lawyers, it's great because we can actually point to that when we get to courts saying, hang on, but this is an obligation on you. And, you know, we talk about net zero being 2050, but actually there are lots of interim targets as well. We've got the carbon budgets and the government has an obligation to meet each carbon budget. It also has an obligation uh, to meet the interim target for 2035, which is why, you know, we can't be pushing off policies into the future saying, oh, it'll be fine by 2050, because actually what you're doing by 2035. And then even closer is we have the Nationally Determined Contribution or NDC, which is what um, is our sort of contribution under the Paris Agreement that individual countries have signed up to. And we've got our NDC for 2030. Again, that's a binding um obligation on the government. So these are all kind of beautiful tools that we can use if we think that the government's acting in a way that's inconsistent, because we can go to court and say that they're not complying, the government's not complying with this, that or the other. Um, so that's the theory. In practice, I find um, that almost um, a large number of cases that I bring on behalf of NGOs and resident groups um, tend to lose in the English courts. Um, I, you know, there, there are a number of reasons for this. One of which is that we ultimately we have a we work within the con confines of public law, and it's there are very few ways in which you can um, 
tackle government policy in the sense that the courts will never step into the role of the decision maker. So you have to reach certain thresholds before court will intervene. And in fact, you know, one of the key ways to win is to be is to be able to say that um, the government policy is irrational or they've acted irrationally. Now, courts historically have been very reluctant to say or endorse that actually a government policy is irrational. You know, they, they don't like getting involved. They say that these are complicated matters of science. There's competing views on all sides. And therefore, um, we're going to defer to what is ultimately a political, technical, scientific, economic, economic um, decision. Uh, so, so that's the kind of gloomy uptake on it. But just to give you a fuller picture, you know, you can win, and there are examples of wins. So the former net zero strategy was challenged in the High Court. It was deemed unlawful. Um, the, high, the High Court judge actually said it was irrational because they didn't have evidence to back up how they were going to meet um, the net zero and the carbon budgets. Um, the, the government has since issued a revised net zero strategy, which came out last year. That is also being challenged. I mean, um, that's actually being heard in a couple of weeks time. It will be very interesting to see how that plays out because actually the climate change committee has said that the policies in the new net zero strategy have a worse <laughs> as in they're like, you know, it's even less likely that we'll meet the various targets. Um, but if we, if we kind of move away from like the very few victories to the uh, the cases that you don't necessarily win, um, I think it's probably just um, to good to highlight, particularly in my self-interest, given that this is the job I do, um, is that not everything is won in court, but the mere fact of bringing litigation can often help. Uh, mm -hmm. Things are settled. I've had... Uh, or like, you know, you can have excessive delays, which means that investors back off from controversial projects. I've had um, quite a few successes, not from like a judgment, but from the process itself. So um, I was acting for a number of uh, residents in Leeds, and they were opposing the expansion to Leeds Bradford Airport. I mean, it went on for years, but ultimately um, the airport shelf their plans because they were like, actually, this is too much mm -hmm. for us. We don't really want to go to a 10 week planning inquiry. See, um, that was one example. The other one is I, um, the Cambo oil field. I know we've recently had Rosebank being um, approved, but Cambo is an example where, again, there was so much threat of litigation and so on around it that it meant that Shell actually withdrew its investment from the oil field and it's been shelved, so that hasn't gone forward, which, again, is a, you know, a huge win, um, which has been brought about by the threat of litigation. And then the final, I think, was a link um, to highlight for now is the effect that it's finally starting to have on the private sector. So there are all these studies that are taking place that show that even the mere filing of a lawsuit, whether in this country or in the States or wherever, has a direct effect on share price. And I think this, perhaps more than anything else, is where we're going to see sort of you know, big companies, carbon majors, rethinking their strategy, um, because obviously they, they care much, much more about their share price than a potentially adverse judgment from from the English High Court. Um, okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say, but just to pick up on Stuthi's last point, um, and I think what you mentioned as well, absolutely cannot stress enough how the UK um, is, is historically more responsible and therefore needs to be doing so much more. And again, we have um, commitments in this regard. They haven't been fleshed out in the English courts yet, but they have been... Um, uh, used by judges in other courts, including in the Australian courts, which is under the Paris Agreement, there is an obligation of what's known as common but differentiated responsibility. And um, and that's exactly what we've been talking about. You know, it's no good for the UK to say, well, we'll get to 2050. They need to be doing much more, much faster, because actually their historic um, role means that they need to be decarbonizing now. They can't really sit and wait till 2050. 2050 is really for other countries who haven't had the chance and don't have the economic resources. Um, so this is a point that we tried to litigate in the UK courts. It's not got anywhere. But, you know, you have to make small, <laughs> um, kind of take small steps when you can. I think that's all from me for now. Yeah, thank you so much, Ruchi. Um, it's great to have those insights into um, the the effect of lawsuits, in particular, um, on corporate activity and on 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 the government. It's um, yeah, it's good to have that insight into into the the uh, broader impact of of law, even if um, even if the cases are not necessarily not necessarily won. Um, I wonder if if we can turn to Baroness Bennett now, if if you'd like to um, 
Sure. Yeah, offer some, okay. offer some insight. Well, I, what I might do wonderful. is just bounce a couple of thoughts mm. on what's already been said. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, perhaps starting with the last point, Rishi's mm. point about delays. I, as you were talking, I was thinking about the anti-fracking movement in the UK, um, which, you know, I... I've lost count. I was standing out on College Green this morning, half freezing, thinking this reminds me of being at an anti-fracking uh, blockade. Um, and it went on for many years. You know, many people put their bodies, uh, put mm -hmm. themselves on the line. And it was eventually, they started off when we first started the fight, talking about, oh, gas is a bridging fuel. And it just became so ridiculous. And it became so expensive that, you know, they were providing lots of jobs, yes, for security guards, because yes. that was what they had to do. And so it was made untenable. And I've got a hashtag I like to use all the time, campaigning works. And we don't collectively, as speaking of movement in the broader sense, we don't celebrate our successes enough. And one of my things is always, you know, sometimes you, you have some kind of halfway legal win or halfway win with the government. And people tend to leap in and say, well, we didn't get everything we want. Mm. Well, mm. what we've got to do, first of all, is say, yay, we won. Mm. It's really important to focus on that winning point. And then maybe, you know, a couple of days later, you might say, well, we still have this extra work to do. Um, but people need hope. People need the feeling that we can make a difference. Mm. And then picking up on what Stuti said, particularly thinking about debt, mm. um, uh, I mean, I was, you know, some of the figures um, is uh, the 42 poor, uh, poorest countries most in need of climate help. On average, 32% of the annual national budget goes to debt repayments. And even I was, I was surprised by this figure myself, Indonesia, 29% of Indonesia's annual budget, mm -hmm. government budget goes in debt. And, you know, we are down the road from the city of London the most corrupt place on this planet. Yeah. And lots of that debt has been let, given to countries, when I say given, thrust on countries um, for all sorts of, in all sorts of corrupt ways for all sorts of bad reasons. And we have to acknowledge that the City of London has been a huge force for harm in the world. And deal with that debt situation mm -hmm. and you know some of the campaigners are saying that that no poorer country should have to pay more than 15 percent of its annual budget in debt that still sounds like quite a lot but it would be a huge improvement on where we are now and i think picking up on that point your point about reparations um you know we do have to come back to why is what we often call the global south now relatively much poorer it's because it was trashed by the global north, by countries like the UK, by the city of London, the financiers. Mm -hmm. And we have been run for centuries, a century by those financial interests. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I rather suspect many people in this room have been on a demonstration where they've chanted system change, not climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. And one final thought is that it's also important to acknowledge that what we can't do is have business as usual with added technology. Mm -hmm. Just doing a straight swap from you know, fossil fuel fueled um, power plants and, uh, and petrol and diesel cars, etc., to electric. It's much more the change we need than that. We need social innovation. Mm -hmm. There's enough resources on this planet for everyone to have a decent life and for us to look after climate and nature if we share them out fairly. And I'm a great lover of um, David Graeber and David Winsome's recent book, The Dawn of Humanity. Mm. And it talks about we've been on this, this planet for 200,000 years as a species, more or less. Um, we've reinvented and recreated ourselves and lived in an amazing range of different ways. Mm. We don't have to live like we are now. Mm. Where we got to now was the result of previous political choices. We can make different political choices. So, you know, I'm going to do my little advert here, which is I have a book coming out in March, which is called Change Everything. So we're far from just talking about changing the technology, mm -hmm. changing the infrastructure. We're talking about changing the way we live and giving people a better way to live because it's not like we're trashing the planet now and we have terrible levels of public health and well-being and mental ill health. Changing everything means both caring for the planet 
but also caring for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll do a book launch for that gorgeous book at SOAS. Yeah. <laughs> All sorted. <laughs> yeah, that's that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I look forward to introducing my students to the to the book and and discussing it with them. Um, there's so many really important points um, made there, and I think a lot of those really tie tie together a lot of the themes that have come out so far. But I think it's also really important to say that when when we talk about the problems that have been um you know caused by by the global north in the global south through through the many many centuries of of colonialism this is also a very ongoing um process and often in the present is done in in a slightly more hidden hidden way um beyond you know the the um the direct domination um of the colonial era we still have a system in which the cheap labor cheap nature resources it is extracted um from the global south to to the global north as standard this is how the how the world um functions and um when we're thinking about debt you know it's really important that we keep um pushing through our movement Movements, um, for a complete reversal of the understanding of debt in in the world economy, where the global south broadly owes owes the global north and is is constantly paying back um, all of um, these uh, really devastating interest um, payments, which means obviously it, it can't spend on on things like um, you know social provision and. Um, and an um, adaptation as well to to climate change really all of that needs needs reversing we need a proper accounting of how the the global north really does owe owe the global south for those many many centuries of, of plunder and the ongoing um drain that's that's going on today um and to just throw in a couple of um a couple of questions that people you know might want to or points that people might want to speak to i mean one is economic growth as the absolute priority of gov government i mean i'm always kind of screaming at the radio when i hear something about um climate change and commitments to net zero and and then you know the, um, moving on to the next segment which is about the absolute imperative of, of economic growth i mean these two things just can't be can't be reconciled once you crunch the numbers um you know economic growth really does mean the um continued expansion of, of fossil fossil fuel um use so that's that's one thing that we can think about is that you know um this contradiction between the government's priority um and the opposition's priority as well towards economic growth which is rarely interrogated you know the question is really asked what kind of or like what do you want to grow what needs to grow um and of course growth could could um be in very unfair and very polluting um sectors and and not in in others which are more socially useful the other theme that i wanted to bring in which is too often um silent in um in conversations around the environment is that of militarism, which is often bracketed off um, outside of, of um, emissions accounting. And of course, we're seeing at the moment, um, you know, the context of, of genocide um, happening in, in Gaza. Of course, this is um, of immediate devastating um, consequences for, for the people of Gaza. But at the same time, it also has very long lasting influence in terms of um, the impact on on the climate and on um, the environment in in the Middle East as well. So um, this is, you know, something that we can think about. How do we bring in, um, you know, account a proper accounting of the the emissions generated by by the military? Um, the U.S. military, we know, is in as an entity in itself, is a greater emitter than than um, Portugal, for example, the entire country, um, and the um, the ongoing um, campaign in in Gaza has had, um, you know, a huge huge impact in in terms of emissions. There was a a recent. Um, uh, report in in the Guardian, which calculated that the first two months of the war in in Gaza um, has generated greater carbon emissions than um, the annual carbon footprint of more than twenty of the world's most climate vulnerable 
vulnerable nations. So thinking about our material support as a country for um, for for these um, military campaigns as well is something that we can we need to really factor into our conversations around around net zero. Um, so those are some some um, additional points to bring in. Um, in in the last sort of half an hour or so, um, first I'll, I'll, I'm just going to ask whether the speakers have any questions for for each other, and then um, we we can throw it out to to the audience for general questions as well. So if you can be thinking about what you'd like to ask the speakers. Um, so do you, do any of you have have any questions for each other or any points that you wanted to bring in? Um, not really a question, but maybe just more of a, a, a comment in terms of um, other ways to look at um, maximizing accountability. I mean, I think you have quite a, a wide variety of um, sectors, if you will, you know, that can participate. So whether it's through legal means, that's obviously one way to keep to keep to be an accountability an accountability partner in that regard. The media, of course, um, uh, is is critical. But I guess if we take a step back, it's um, I think the first question to to for all of us to ask is how clear um, is the public on what these goals are? Um, because I think in order to be able to hold someone accountable, they have to be clear. And at the end of the day, like in any country, it's it's the voters who uh, will take it to the streets, if you will. And, you know, um, so how how clear is that understanding to everyday men, if you will? Because mm -hmm. we can sit here and debate about, you know, our knowledge, whether it's medium or deep, you know, around these issues. But um, how does it affect the person on the ground in terms of their understanding? And, and then how do you um, bring together, uh, you know, uh, more a layman's understanding of the impact with the decisions that you know government is is making um, um and or you know uh, your communities are making that will impact your lives mm -hmm. kind of again goes back to um, um the scenario that i mentioned about talking to someone in a rural community to say don't cut down the tree because you're you know there's no context you know and so sometimes there's the challenge that we may have is you know to really make it plain, you know, um, so that we can get the support for these types of things that, um, in the long run, you know, really do affect us um, so much. So, uh, the legal team is doing well. Media can always be great. I mean, look at what's happening in um, in in the country right now. Of course, I'm a media advocate, so I'm always going to speak about that as an example. But in terms of what's happening with the post office, it was a drama series that really brought it home. And that's that's where your advocacy skills can, can come from. How do you then translate it down to the everyday man? Mm -hmm. You know, because I mean, from what I've read and have been seeing, um, the the issue didn't really hit home until that drama series hit the air, and it really touched people's lives. So, how does this affect me? You know, in my home, how do you get that emotive response uh, from someone to be able to then be an advocate for change for the whole world? Because mm -hmm. that's really what it is in the long run. Yeah, wonderful points. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether um, would either of you like to speak to that, or would um, I'm not sure whether Stuti can hear us. On she comes in. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things. One on what you were saying, Lisa, about economic growth. I think this is something that frustrates me as well because I think I don't think that they're incompatible, like getting to net zero and economic growth, because what's often missed out from the equation is the financial cost of climate change. So that's never factored into, you know, the kind of the scale of destruction that we are going to see is, is unimaginable. Mm -hmm. And you're not factoring in the cost of that when you are saying, oh, it's going to cost me this much to do X. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, but again, it comes back to how much government is willing to look at the figures on both sides, um, rather than just a very binary way of looking at things. And then on the media, yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more, actually, that's all absolutely correct. The only thing that I would say in terms of a nuance in this, at least in England, as as I understand it, is that climate is actually like a top three or four polling issue. So it is one of the few examples where the public 
is far ahead of government policy at the minute. And it, the only issues that come above it are the cost of living crisis and the NHS. It's, it's usually above like the housing crisis, crime, you know, all the traditional sort of polling issues have sort of been swept away a bit because of how deeply I think the public do care. And see, um, when policy doesn't catch up with it, it's quite frustrating, but I think that's all for me to say for now. As we're saying, it's just one part of the wider picture in terms of it, it's in addition, you know, no one is saying the legal thesis are going to win the climate change battle, but it's one aspect, you know, in addition to campaigning, in addition to protests, um, civil disobedience, uh, media, public awareness, all of that works together. But just on the legal point, I mean, my from my insight, I think it absolutely works. I mean, you have to push away slowly, but you do get there. So even time, so... Uh, just to explain, so in the UK, for sort of any renewable projects or for um, oil and gas, you need planning permission or a consent of some type. And that's the space that I work in, which is why I sort of ended up specializing in climate. But um, we have a very kind of weird, complex system of planning inquiries where th that's the battleground, whether, you know, a solar farm should be allowed or whether there should be a, coal, a new coal mine. I mean, five years ago, if you argued about climate as a material consideration during those planning inquiries, you'd be laughed at. Like that just wasn't a thing. And now that is the, the norm. So it is, you know, that like no planning inspector will ever ignore the climate impact or the greenhouse gas emissions impact. So it's taken a while. It it involved a lot of people arguing what was seen as extreme. I mean, the other aspect is human rights. So that's argued a lot as well, because um, as I'm sure everyone here is aware, but the kind of differential impacts, even in this country, in terms of climate change and greenhouse gas, et cetera, so on and so forth, is seen most on um, people from certain race or certain socioeconomic background. So again, this is an argument that people are trying to raise. They're not very successful at the minute, but that doesn't mean that we should stop raising them because I think we will get to a point where actually that will again then become part of the de facto background against which you analyze whether a project should go ahead or not. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, if I yeah. could just, just <laughs> very, very briefly picking up about the point about um, public understanding, uh, and I think one of the problems, and your point about growth, is basically the public have been told business as usual with added technology, mm -hmm. oh, we've just got to put on the solar panels and the wind farms and the electric cars. Um, there hasn't been an explanation of the need for the social transformation, the social innovation. Um, and what that's then meant is both our own Committee on Climate Change in the UK and the UNFCCC, to make the numbers add up as we've pushed closer and further and further forward, they've started getting carbon capture and storage at scale. We've started inventing these new technologies in 10 years' time. We'll be able to scrub carbon out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they're doing that is because they're assuming business as usual, people living the same way, and we can't. And actually, just down the corridor from here, we had a really good meeting um, with four authors of chapters of the next um, UNFCCC report. And actually, the last UNFCCC report, they deliberately started to talk to anthropologists, started to talk to sociologists. They started to stick their toe in the water of social change, structural change, economic change, getting away from economic growth. Mm -hmm. But the practical reality is, I mean, at the moment, you know, if you if you Googled Hansard, which is the record of the British Parliament, and my name, you you cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. That is my shorthand way of getting to all of these issues. And I probably said it dozens of times in the House. But at the moment, the own Green Party, I'm not being party political here, it's just a fact, is the only party mm. that's prepared to say that. But I think in terms of the politics, we have to get across the idea to people that we've had growth, we've had planet trashing, mm -hmm. they've created a pretty terrible society. Mm -hmm. Just look at the state of people's lives now, insecurity, poverty, inequality. And so you know, we're offering something different thought experiment, if we'd created a wonderful society where everyone had a, had a wonderful, great income, affordable, warm mm -hmm. homes, security of life, mm -hmm. and then we found there was a climate emergency and the scientists came out and said, oh, we've got to change things. That would be really politically difficult. Now we have an opportunity to say we can fix all of our social issues mm -hmm. and fix our environmental issues 
And that's good news because that's how we can make all of our lives better. And we've got to explain that to people. And that job has not yet been done, but we've all got to work on it. Okay, wonderful points. Um, so we can go to the audience now. I think I'll I'll take um three questions and then go back to the to the speakers and um, then we'll hopefully have time for for another round. So if I start kind of left left to right, would you would you like to? Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Now on the social change aspect. Um, by the way, I spent a whole day today going to all the committee rooms and there was a lot of great debate. And you're right. I'm, I went to this uh, cybersecurity summit, which is uh, held by the parliamentary think tank, where I went there, we were all visitors. Everyone was sitting like, it doesn't matter, like, you know, students, professors, MPs, uh, policy makers. And it was great to have a place for the public to be able to all just have a discussion with it, obviously good chairing. And I think that's that's where I see the future heading to. We need more of those kind of opportunities for the public to be able to speak um, because we all are gonna do the change. And going to some of these committee meetings is good to see and hear, but sometimes somebody might know something quickly say something, but we can't. So moving forward, we need some sort of more think tanks for MPs and policymakers to hear how we can do the social change. And we just need to keep doing, keep going ahead with the technology. And I love this whole tech, you know, we need to keep making this more public. Like those public meetings will be great to live stream them and have, you know, the media actually pick up on them and say, oh, you can watch this instead of Chris, People, what do they, what people watch today? BBC, and then BBC doesn't even talk about 20,000 people that died in Gaza, yeah? Because the agenda is completely different in BBC. So we need more of that, so that that's how we get the general public, is by engaging and getting more, more activists speak. Thank you, thanks so much. So the gentleman at the back there in the, in the pink shirt, thank you. I was wondering when it comes to issues of climate justice, should we be focusing more on cutting emissions as soon as possible, the like toxic countries like India and the West? Or should we be focused on the demands for less, you know, providing funding for green lunch in developing countries or lots and damage funds? Because ultimately, they're back the root causes in the fossil fuel emissions first. Mm -hmm. So, do you think we should, like, country that we should focus on decarbonizing their economies first or cutting these in developing countries and helping them? Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, so the, the gentleman in front there, yeah. Yeah, um, my name is Sarah my expertise is in supply chains. And whenever I look at supply chains, I always look at the country I'm born in, the UK. And for me, the supply chains always start somewhere in the global south, somewhere in Africa or India or South America. Because that's where 99% of the resources are. We can't do anything in the UK without Africa. That's the point of fact. My question is, there's a lot of talk about carbon emissions, how we're going to do stuff in the UK or the G7 countries. There's not been any mention in the last 10 years about where and how of all the resources, the tin, the copper, the bauxite, the lead, the cobalt, all these resources you require for making the wind turbines, the solar panels, the electric cars, the sensors. They're coming from Congo. They're coming from Western Africa. They're coming from Zambia. They're coming from all across Africa, just looking at one continent, not even looking outside. And I'm astonished that there does not seem to be any mention of the fact that when you've got one mine, which is 200,000 men, women, and children clambering on top of each other to get the cobalt, so we can have an electric car. And how did they get those minerals? They had to deforest and strip mine their indigenous forests of thousands of years. <coughs> so destroy the communities and livelihoods. And I'm told, so we can have a green capturing device in the UK. And I was like, but we already had that in Africa, it's called forest. Why are we replacing the forests, which is giving people the sovereignty your symbiosis in nature, and we're selling it 
is a corporate product of the Japanese, so we can have in the UK. There is no mention of the fact that to function every single one of these mines, as I asked a lot of people, you divest from fossil fuels, what's the alternative? People tell me wind and solar. I was like, okay, you've got the steel and the concrete. They need to be made by how? You need to burn fossil fuels to make them. Again, that's in Africa. So the most important aspect of this supply chain is the one that is not mentioned at all, which is in between the forests in Africa and the mines where those 200,000 people are in Congo. Why is it there's no mention of this? Why is it this is about climate justice and systems change? There's no mention of the fact that without Western Africa, there would be no nuclear and there would be no France. And without nuclear energy as a backup, you would have no solar energy. You need it as a backup. So the question here is, it's not about what we are privileged to have in the UK. The question should be, what are you going to do as the alternative to fossil fuels? It's not renewables because renewables are built for fossil fuels. And where are you going to give reparations and how are you going to give reparations to the people in Africa or India for the forests we've stripped mine so we can have an electric car, which in this weather, they're already freezing, right? You can't even move the electric car. That's another joke. So the question is, where is the people who are talking about the aspect of supply chains? If we are squirming at seeing babies killed in Palestine, in Gaza, and how it comes in the last 10 years, with 10 years, we've never squirmed when we see, we don't want to see the babies or the six-year-old children mining minerals for our green deal in Africa. That's something that's not going to be addressed. Why are we talking about Thank you. Thanks so much. So we have um, three really important questions there. I mean, the first one sort of speaks to the question of having more democratic spaces for, for community input broadly. The second one is is um, this balance between um, cutting, cutting emissions as soon as possible or adaptation and, and justice and um, whether those, I suppose, should be should be in sequence. And then the final one, a really important um, question around um, around supply chains and critical mineral extraction and the you know the um, the drastic impact of that on on communities in in the global south. Um, so at the moment, I'm personally working on on nickel extraction in in Indonesia, which um, is uh, carbon carbon fueled. Um, the processing is is carbon fueled and um, speaks to all the all the themes that you've um, you've brought in around deforestation, um, the um, the displacement of of communities and um, serious uh, contamination through um, obviously you know the um, the tailings from from the mines and the um, the impact of the actual processing. Of the nickel, which kind of coats communities in, in quite toxic red red dust. So those are definitely important themes to to bring in. Um, so I'll go I'll go back to, to the speakers. Um, I don't know if you if you want to. Um, maybe just a, a, a couple of quick thoughts. Um, in terms of the climate justice issue, the emissions versus adaptation. I don't think we can wait. I think it should be simultaneous. I mean, there's there's no other way um, in order to to be that because we're behind schedule even as it is. Mm -hmm. um, I won't answer the last question um, because I think it's something that the global south has has been speaking about for many many decades. So um, oftentimes, when there needs to be a um, a shift, a major shift, you need advocates. Um, if you look at any major movements, it's when the other gets involved, uh, it helps tip it over the edge. Um, as a continent, we can, you know, raise it. I think we have. Um, but when the whole world comes behind it, because at the end of the day, you're correct in saying that we don't have electric cars right now. Certainly in Zambia, I haven't seen an electric car. I think we may have hybrids, but today, not an electric car. Um, we're still de dealing with some um, electricity challenges, so electric car is not going to be the best choice at this point in time. So in that sense, um, 
it's not our issue in you know in in that sense but it is an issue here obviously as I see more uh, electric car charging stations there's more of an expansion you know which is fantastic but yes how do we deal with the root mm. how do we deal with the root and the the big thing on everyone's lips is you know uh, critical minerals it's all about critical minerals so hopefully this iteration of development um that when we do this new transition that you bring the owners of the resources along the journey you know we can't carve up the continent like it was before and just leave it and just strip it at the end of the day we are all impacted and i mean maybe the, the, the this whole climate um, catastrophe that we are um, um, experiencing and will experience even further is an indication that you know we need to we need to do better i mean i just covid should have taught us a lot in terms of how connected we are you know um so we may be getting another chance but we have to do it right we have to do it right and those who have more resources really must take a much more profound leadership position around these discussions you know and guidance and coming from a partnership perspective and leave something on the table leave something on the table you know so that's where i'll <laughs> Um, very quickly, um, on the first point um, about social change and democracy, it's interesting, both the UK, unfortunately, it was through the middle of the start of COVID, but we had a people's assembly, a climate assembly, um, which came up with a whole lot of good recommendations. France did a similar process, and there's a lovely case study from France, because their people's assembly, which is a representative group of citizens, you know, of, of just quote unquote, ordinary people, sitting down to deliberate on what to do about climate. And they told the government in France that um, all flights where the train journey was less than four and a half hours should be abandoned. There should be no flights. And the government went, ooh, that's a bit scary, and went for two and a half hours. So very often that People's Assembly deliberatively democracy process, again and again, this is also the case with Ireland with both equal marriage, so-called gay marriage, with abortion rights, reproductive rights in Ireland, the People's Assembly was far ahead of where the politicians were. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to get those deliberative processes going. I think the second either or, it has to be both. No question about that. And finally, the point about supply chains and sourcing. I actually happened to be this morning, um, Zoheb was with me um, at a, um, a, I think this could potentially create lots of work the Rushi, um, uh, there's a proposal for a law for a duty to prevent um, adverse impacts on um, both human rights and environmental impacts. Now, the EU has brought in a weaker version of this, but there is actually in the House of Lords now a private member's bill, which hopefully will be debated in March or April, and that will put the duty to prevent on corporations not to do human rights damage or not to do environmental damage anywhere in their supply chain. Um, I'm not saying it's a panacea, of course, nothing is a panacea, but you you, you can probably see there's 30, about 35 NGOs of the coalition that are pushing mm. this. And you know some of them are the obvious ones like um, Global Justice Now, Anti-Slavery International, but there's also the TUC, the Trade Union Council, Unison, the, the union, there is a broad understanding of broadly progressive forces in our society that we can't keep ripping the resources out of the global south, out of Africa and other parts of the global south. And so people are working on this. I can't actually claim that we've got terribly far, but it, there is acknowledgement we're working on it. Richie, would you like to speak to any of that? Um, no, I think that's all been covered really okay. well. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, if Stuti has any, if she can hear the um, the questions. I was wondering, um, an organizer of social change, which I completely agree, we need an entire systematic change to address um, climate change, which is market failure on the part of capitalism. However, given that the immediate decade and immediate years to come, we're not looking, you know, it's not likely, you know, our political options here in the UK, even less so in the US, to 
changed systematically around that. Um, and given the fact that the leading cause of carbon emissions is TNCs, so governments have limited impacts when it comes to taxes anyway, because um, uh, corporations are not limited to any one country. What, um, what can we do as citizens to bypass government, bypass politics essentially, and try and attack the corporations that are doing this outside, you know, because carbon credits aren't really being as effective as we need them to be immediately. So yeah, what can we do to attack the corporations? Okay. Wonderful questions. Thank you so much. I think we'll probably have to leave it for the questions there and and um and go back to the speakers. Um who would like to who would like to start? I go for it. I, 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 I'm gonna do a do a do a rapid fire 30 second one minute on each question, okay. which gives everyone else a chance to talk. First of all, the question about judicial review. Um I bring a particular House of Lords perspective to this because you might have heard um, one of our legal eagles. There's lots of King's Council, very senior lawyers in the House of Lords and the House listens to them and going on about Henry VIII's clauses. Um, and what that is, is essentially a line in a bill that says the minister will have the power to regulate about something. But there is nothing in the bill that sets out the purpose of what that regulation is for. And that's broadly, I'm not a lawyer, you could do this much better, but that's what a Henry VIII clause is. And it means then the regulation is not is not judiciable. You can't take it to court if the bill didn't say what the minister was supposed to do. And so the government is very, very deliberately, utterly trying to get around that. And I don't think we haven't had a promise from Her Majesty's loyal opposition, they're going to stop doing that. So it's a real problem of in our politics that actually fewer and fewer things are now subject to judicial review because of Henry VIII's clauses. Loss and damage, where did the number come from? What can we get out of the Treasury? And how can we twist Treasury's arm by saying, if it's smaller than that, we will look really, really silly? And speaking from not exactly inside government, but inside this place, that's what it's like. Now, that is me. That is going to be me, but I'm, I'm going to quickly whip through the rest. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I've lost the question for financial sector. Um, uh, you actually get some people, the better end of companies, are saying, we want security of policy. We can't invest unless we have secure government policy. And so... That's not happening. The government's, you think about the classic is the, the feed in tariff when they ripped the whole rug out from underneath the solar installation people. And finally, I'm afraid I, I disagree with you on political options in that political change doesn't happen slowly and gradually. It happens in big jumps. The last change in politics was the election of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in the States. We've had 40 years of neoliberalism. Mm. Practically no one around here remembers anything except neoliberalism. But when it changes, it changes fast. And I think the one thing we know is things are not going to stay the same as they are now. They're profoundly unstable. Uh, and so I think it's either going to come broadly our way or it's going to go far right. Those are now the two political options. And the change, if you look at after the election of Thatcher and Rager, the change happens very fast. So... And I think we can't take on even, you know, community group, campaign group, do what you can, but it's only government regulation and governments getting together that will, that will beat the TNCs. We can't do it as individuals. And now I've got to go and do my, my individual bit. I will be back. Excuse me. <laughs> Rachel, would you like to, to speak to any of that? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you. See, the first question on the tension between judicial review and sort of getting to net zero, I think I, I sort of took from your question, is there sort of, and this might not be your take, but, you know, um, is there an issue there where if there are more and more judicial reviews being brought, like does government become more um, <laughs> defensive and therefore more likely to push in these Henry VIII clauses? Um, and I mean, on the one hand, yes, there is that risk, um, but it's not a new risk. And it's not just an environmental issue. I think as was being said, this happens across all policies. So like um, the Rwanda policy was challenged in the court successfully. 
uh, previously, things like, you know, prorogation of parliament, etc. I mean, there is a conscious civic society, I think, in this country that is willing to challenge outrageous decisions. And I, I don't think that um, environment, in that sense, I don't think environmental judicial reviews are unique. Um, we have a precedent for how we can challenge these things. So that's, I think that's helpful. Um, I think just um, looking through some of the other, yeah, on the financial sector, I mean, I agree. It's a bit like we were talking about what the public want. Actually, again, a lot of, I'm not talking about like carbon majors, but a lot of the other private sector actually want the stability from government, want to understand what they can be doing. And um, then just on that final question on social change, and this links, um, I think what Manchenji, Manchenji was saying, which, which is, you know, what's being put out there, there's not, there is, uh, people obviously understand climate is an issue and biodiversity is an issue and we need to be tackling those, but I don't think there is a full understanding of what that actually means. It's not just about putting a solar panel on your roof. Mm -hmm. And that is one area that we're definitely lacking in. Mm -hmm. And I think people can feel more empowered if they have that information, which isn't necessarily there at the minute. Um, yeah, I think that is my point. Great. Um, does Jitty want to come in with any any points? I was thinking that she uh, had to go. So uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We are actually out of out of time anyway. So um, I don't know, Machenda, do you want to have the last word? Um, maybe just uh, just a couple of mm. things, just to 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 close on some of the <clears throat> issues raised with the questions. Um, the judicial review, obviously, you are embarrassing you. You'll. I'll I'll leave that in your good hands. Um, uh, from a financial sector perspective, I think that's one of the things that we're doing in Zambia, uh, creating policies that uh, um, uh, allow for a conducive, um, you know, business environment in, in the country. Um, our president, when he came into power in 2021, created a, a new ministry of green economy and environment. So um, that really shows the commitment towards uh, looking at the future in that regard. Because... Uh, as, as a small African nation state, state, our value is not only in our people, but it's our resources under the ground. You know, uh, our president always says, you know, we're walking on diamonds and gold and uh, gemstones and all the, um, you know, these critical minerals that the world is after. So how we um, partner with the rest of the world is going to be critical because it's going to be tied into the future of our country and its development and particularly the development of our people. As a continent, you know that, or you may not know, but uh, the continent of Africa is, I think, 60% of the population is under the age of 30. Mm -hmm. So from a workforce perspective, where will the future workforce of the world come from? Hence, looking at um, whether it's public education around key issues to make sure we have advocates around the world, that's critical. Young people connecting and talking to each other and learning from each other. We have all kinds of tools now that allow communication globally to be faster, whether it's the TikTok or the this or the that. I mean, you know, um, uh, there's there there are abilities for small groups to form, or what's the term that the, the people's forums that could could take different platforms. You know, they could take place on different platforms, and they could be global in nature. Um, from a political perspective, a, a political option and, and looking at change, that's something that we went through uh, in Zambia. I think once people's tolerance gets to a certain level, they'll make it clear that it's time to shift or change the script, if you will. Um, so maybe that's where we are mm -hmm. to be seen. But hopefully with this key issue, um, you know, I think we really do need to uh, join forces collectively to make it so. So that's a really wonderful note to end on. And it's been a fantastic session. I've definitely learned a lot from, from all the speakers and, and the audience contributions as well. So if you could just join me in, in thanking the speakers and <laughs> If I can say, someone should say thank you to the chair as well. So thank you.